cover fire. Ops list updated. Okay, subject is in. Extraction arrived at Mother Base.
are more clear shortly. Subject on board. Leave the rest to us.
Roger that. Uh, uh, 
The map has been updated. Please select a mission. Unit dispatched. Please select a mission. Unit dispatched. Unit dispatched.
well placed. Detected. The map has been updated. approaching.
Welcome to PsyDop's list updated. Subject on board. Leave Extra the rest to us. Arrived at Mother Base. placed. Please select a drop point. Supplies requested. Development complete. Supply drop complete. The map has been updated.
detected. Map has been updated. Marker placed. Development project has been added.
also led to mission. The map has been updated.
extract him. Subject on board. Leave the rest to us. Detected and the map has been updated. Analysis complete. Analysis complete. Analysis complete.
Analysis complete. Analysis complete.
Please select a mission. Development project has been added. Commencing platform construction.
extraction arrived at the motor base. mission.
Extraction arrived at Mother Base.
Please select supplies requested. Mother base is now in the red. Supply drop complete.
Subject on board. Leave the rest to us. Side off completed. Side ops list. Subject on board. Leave the rest to us. Extraction arrived at the mother base. He's coming too. Roger that. Mission except the map has been updated. Marga placed. In the deepest
The map has been updated. Enemy prison detected. The map has been 
You have arrived at your destination. Good. We captured it alive. Find and extract the missing CIA agent. The target was laying low with a friendly Mujahideen during the vocal cord parasites incident. The man headed back to OKB-0 after the Soviets recaptured it. Check the target's VI on your iDroid. Unit dispatched. Project. Extraction arrived at mother base. Analysis complete. Analysis complete. Analysis complete. Analysis complete. Analysis complete. Analysis. The map has been updated. Analysis complete. Stop while you use the iDroid. You can even move around while using it, but pay attention to your surroundings.
forces. He's coming too. Roger that. The map has been That's the target. Searching for the target. Now you just need to extract him. Subject on board. Leave the rest to us. Help me! That's it. You've made it out of the hot zone. No sign of the enemy. Mission complete, boss. Extraction arrived at Mother Base. Amazing. Mission complete. That right there is why you're the best, boss. The one and only. Peggy, 18.
filled us in on what's been going on. He betrayed the Soviets, passing information to Langley, but got scared after learning XOF used the vocal cord parasites. Then came feelings of guilt that his leaks sent comrades to their deaths, and fear that America might deploy such a weapon itself. But in reality, XOF and Langley don't have a collaborative relationship, and Skullface was not working for America. Still, I can't blame the man for being afraid. After laying low with the Mujahideen, he tried to cut his ties with the U.S. and return to the Soviet military. But along the way, someone came after him, and he was forced back into hiding. Could have been remnants of XOF looking to silence him. And you know the rest. He doesn't seem to know much about the parasites, but nevertheless, it'd be too dangerous to hand him over to Langley or the Soviets. We'll keep him here as originally planned. Good. He captured it alive. It's a pretty rare animal you caught. finished development on that battle gear of his. Get back to Mother Base. Approaching. The Battle Gear is an armored weapon developed to take on hostile bipedal weapon systems. But unlike the Soviet-funded Walker Gear, the Battle Gear still hasn't been properly field tested. I'd like to assign a combat unit to take it on dispatch missions, so that we can evaluate its capabilities and reliability. Assuming you've got no objections, give the order to dispatch the unit from your iDroid.
Please select a mission. that Cypher was having the PF's transport. Before we met you, the boss recovered it from a truck crossing the savanna. Are there metallic archaea inside it? Yes, the archaea metabolize uranium-235 to subsist. They must be stored inside yellow cake, or they cannot survive. So those biological traces we took for impurities were actually the real cargo. Of course, they are deactivated so they do not trigger a sudden enrichment. They are like baker's yeast. Yet, they do gradually enrich the uranium as they feed. I imagine you detected weapons-grade traces. Yeah, we did. And the malachite that was loaded on the truck had traces of uranium in it, too. <laughs> so that's the flower, huh? Skullface was gonna sell do-it-yourself new kits. The uranium enriching Archaea complete with the user's manual. And the ores with the uranium could be sourced by the client or provided by Cypher. Even the trace amounts buried in common ores can be enriched to weapons-grade uranium by the metallic Archaea. Proving that must have been the most important factor of the trials. That and the ability to successfully prevent detonation. So if the amounts of uranium in the ores are low enough, they can get past any inspection. And you only need a tiny amount of the Archaea to act as the yeast. No great challenge to smuggle that either. The first step towards saturating the world with nukes. His plan. That was not my intention. <laughs> my only goal in developing the metallic Archaea was to save the Diné. What made you think a tool for creating undetectable nuclear weapons would save your people? After 70 years, the Diné reclaimed the Navajo the Nation from which we were banished. We bore all the hardships of poverty. But we were proud to live off the land we called our own. But in the moment the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, everything changed. I don't get it. The nuclear arms race between the U.S. and the Soviet Union began with the end of the Second World War. Suddenly, there was a massive demand for uranium. And it was our ill fortune that the ground beneath the Navajo Nation was rich with uranium ore. The Black Anna government set up mine after mine, and many of the Diné worked them, never informed of any danger. Every day, they went to work with no protection. The slag was simply piled out in the open. When rain fell, uranium traces left behind would seep out, and when the ground dried, it was blown about as dust. Land and water were contaminated, irradiated. Many of us became sick and died. That pain lives on to this day. I had no idea. Wanting more than anything to revive the land my forebears left to me, I was delighted upon discovering microbes that eat uranium. If they could be domesticated, I believed we could rid our land of uranium. Were you successful? No. The research called for funding on a colossal scale. But nobody was willing to invest with no prospect of a return. And that's when Skullface showed up. Let's Correct. I can save you and your people. We share the same will. That is what he said to me, and I believed him. Black Anna forced me to abandon my uranium cleanup work and focus on nuclear weapons. And he helped.
out all the Dine hostage. Today, the uranium mines within the reservation are finally closing down. It is simply less expensive now to source uranium overseas. New victims, different places. But uranium is a tactical resource. To rely on a foreign country for it is... a difficult decision to make. And he was in the perfect place to influence that decision. He could have condemned your people to the mines forever. The contamination comes not only from uranium. The fallout from the Nevada nuclear tests also settled on our lands. As if our fortune were not already bad enough. We are also downwinders. To save the Diné, I must complete my original research. The one that covers the parasite that lives on the surface of the skull's bodies is what gives them their power. Similar to my children who live in my skin. I modified the parasites I isolated from the body of that old man, differentiating them with various abilities. One that can blend perfectly into its surroundings by exposing the pigments in its cells at will. Another that by harboring multiple species of metallic archaea can oxidize and reduce metal. Isolating the one that covers and transplanting it into an artificial medium should provide the same abilities as the skulls. But they can only subsist within a human body once transplanted into the medium. They will eventually die. Another thing, the weakness of the one that covers is desiccation. Their surface moisture loss is greater than ours. The reason they give off mist is to alleviate this by releasing the salts inside them as microparticles. Water vapor condenses around them, appearing as mist. But this dries out the atmosphere until they cannot even produce mist. And once their supply of water from the host runs out, the parasites are in danger. They, along with their host, enter a form of suspended animation. However, a similar effect occurs if they come into contact with a large amount of water. Rain, for instance. The one that covers will temporarily abandon other processes in his eagerness to absorb the water. Make the weather your ally. Hewitt's dug up some interesting facts about our skull-faced friend. Nine years ago, he was exiled to South Africa, stripped of political power. The upshot's that he ceased being a serious threat, in Cypher's eyes anyway. They eased up on surveillance, giving him an opening to establish his own military unit, one that answered to his will alone. Those men likely had no idea their orders were coming from Skullface. They probably didn't even know the organization was a part of Cypher at all. Anyway, it was in South Africa where he found renewed interest in parasites. And when he discovered the vocal cord parasites, he began to make his plan. Wipe the English language out of existence. Free the world, not by taking men's lives, but by taking their tongues. In his eyes, the greatest symbiotic parasite the world's ever known isn't microbial. It's linguistic. Words are what keep civilization, our world, alive. There was something Skullface said. America is made up of many peoples, but those peoples never mix. Quite so. One nation, home to hundreds of different ethnic groups, many of whom stick to their respective living areas, little colonies, not interacting with other groups, going out of their way to avoid one another, 
the land, organizations, relationships. Thus, the United States of America is no melting pot. It is more of a salad bowl. It is not made up from one people, but for its minorities to function in society, a common ground is needed. Language. Even if the country is not one, no, because it's not one, a lingua franca is necessary. English. American hegemonism was born from the illusion that English could unite diverse ethnicities. In taking in people from around the globe, America became a microcosm of it. Now the boundaries between it and the rest of the world have become blurred. However different our neighbors may be, English enables us to create symbiotic relationships with each other. If English can bring unacquainted neighbors together in America, this should hold true for the world. This salad bowl that is the world can also become one. Select unit, staff assigned. Select unit, staff assigned. Please select a land landing zone. For Roger. Flight. Caution. Rain. This is Caution. Pequot. Arriving shortly at LZ. This is Pequot. On station at Please LZ. Specify a project.
chance to prove our suspicions about Emmerich. Head to the central base camp in Afghanistan and recover that AI pod. It's time we purge Diamond Dogs of that traitorous parasite once and for all. Please select a landing zone. Heading to Central Africa. Approaching. I have spoken enough. Your men can take it from here. Will you permit me to rest? Have something to eat? I thought you don't eat. I can subsist without food. But there is more oh, to the act of okay. eating than nourishment. We receive nature's blessings and reaffirm our part in it. And in doing so, we express our gratitude. <laughs> Sorry, it's um, hearing you say you don't need to eat and that you're a part of nature in the same breath. Anyway, uh, what can we get you? Not exactly a five-star restaurant, but the kitchen's used to serving a lot of different appetites. Hamburgers. Ah, uh, hamburgers? Even we didn't have become Americanized. I eat them often back home. <laughs> and you just can't let them go. Well, as far as symbols of the American Empire go, hamburgers are pretty good. The victory of capitalism. Hmm. Your people suffered so much at the hands of America. And you ask for hamburgers. We have suffered more than you can know. But I do not see hamburgers as an accomplice. A single dish providing a balanced helping of nature's blessings. Meat, grain, and vegetable. How could anyone hate such a magnificent thing? Says the guy who can survive on photosynthesis. Balance has nothing to do with it. You just like a good burger. That is also true. Be warned, though. I have very high standards. <sighs> Don't worry. I do, too. All right, then. One good, old-fashioned, all-American icon coming up. <laughs> I look forward to it. Thank <laughs> you. 
clouds approaching. You mentioned that the man on fire was crushed under Sophilanthropus in its hangar. Yeah. He was caught under the wheels of its transport platform. Yeah. But his body wasn't found. What? We searched the area the moment we arrived, but there was no trace of him. I wasn't hallucinating. I know. I trust you on that. That means someone must have taken the body. When I got there, everything was still as it was. Even Skullface hadn't been touched. I can't see a reason to sneak into a place like that and drag out the biggest, heaviest guy there. What are you getting at? The only option left is... He got up and walked away. That platform ran him over. Just ran him over. You're saying that's not enough? I don't want to believe it, but maybe not. He shrugs off bullets, even rocket strikes. There's no reason to think that would finish him. It seems ridiculous, but I'll start gathering eyewitness accounts just in case. If you dig up anything concrete, I want to know. You'll be the first, if I dig anything up. But I hope to hell I don't. No kidding. Please select a landing zone. Heading to Central Africa. approaching. Clouds approaching. Please specify a project. Please select a mission. Please select a landing zone. Heading to Central Africa.
Please select a mission. Enemy unit dispatched. The map has been updated. Be careful down there, boss. Please select a mission. here on BBC World News. headlines from BBC News. My name is Mike Hambly. EU leaders holding talks in Brussels on how to tackle the migrant crisis have agreed to provide 1 billion euros to help millions of Syrian refugees in the Middle East. The money will go to UN agencies operating in Lebanon, Jordan and Turkey. Special reception centres will be set up in European frontline states by the end of November. The Colombian president and leader of the FARC, rebels, have agreed to set up a truth commission to deal with crimes committed during more than 50 years of conflict. The deal is seen as a major breakthrough after nearly three years of peace talks. A final peace accord is to be signed within the next six months. On the first day of his first visit to the U.S., Pope Francis has met President Obama at the White House. He called for urgent action to tackle climate change. He described it as a problem that can no longer be left to a future generation. He also called on Americans to build a tolerant society.
Now on BBC World News, Hard Talk asks tough questions in interviews with people shaping the news this week. Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. The British government wants parliamentary authorization to bomb the jihadists of IS inside Syria. That same government adamantly does not want to offer refuge to any of the many tens of thousands of Syrian refugees now homeless and desperate inside Europe. Does David Cameron's position make sense? Well, my guest is ex-soldier and now influential Conservative MP Crispin Blunt. From Syria to Britain's future in Europe, foreign policy looks like a minefield for Mr Cameron. Can he find a safe way through it? Crispin Blunt, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. For the second time, Prime Minister David Cameron wants to extend the British military intervention against so-called Islamic State, IS, into Syria. Now, there was a vote in 2013 you didn't support. What about this time? Well, it's not the same question that's being put to us. Last time it was about depriving the Syrian regime of its chemical weapons. And the proposal that was put forward to Parliament, in my judgment, wasn't going to achieve the objective. And in the end, the objective was achieved with the assistance of Russian pressure. Um, getting Bashar al-Assad to, uh, to deprive his own regime of chemical weapons. So that objective was achieved. So you, this you, is your a, argument this is a diff different target, different objective, but the same issues of legality and strategic coherence still apply. Because... Unlike in Iraq, where British uh, aerial attacks are taking place alongside Americans mm. and others, uh, where the government has invited those yep. forces in, in Syria, Bashar al-Assad has clearly not invited Western Absolutely. forces to attack. That's no, that is precisely the point. And, but, of course, Parliament has yet to see the, the request that's going to be put forward. Uh, my committee has been taking evidence on... Uh, the situation in Syria, and, and I think we're all, certainly I'm in the place where most expert commentators would be, and actually where international policy seems finally to be edging towards. You, if I may just sort of, in a sense, shortcut what yeah. you're about to say, because it, it, it's quite simple. You, you have a track record, and I've been studying it, of saying that, you know, pinprick airstrikes against IS extended to Syria won't change the outcome. And you have made it quite clear that, in your view, just doing something because there's an outcry and something exactly. must be done is not an adequate strategy. Unless there's a much, much more coherent strategic vision, you appear to say, I can't support this. Uh, indeed. I don't think we should be uh, drawing the United Kingdom into the legal uh, morass that is Syria unless we have made that morass clear. And Cameron that hasn't, can't, has he? Not yet. And neither has... And this is, in the end, this is not a... British issue. I don't think the United Kingdom is going to be, is key to this. Much more important are the actions of countries like Turkey, uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia and of course behind them uh, countries such as Russia and obviously the United States. Now the United Kingdom should have a role to play in a clear international coalition where there is an authorised international strategy underneath a United Nations Security Council resolution. But to be clear, if I may, to be clear, you've just said to me, no, as of right now, Cameron hasn't outlined the kind of coherent, wider vision for what to do against the Daesh or Islamic State that would satisfy you to vote for military intervention in Syria. So the mathematics here is yep. important. You are saying that if a vote was presented to Parliament today, you would still, as you did in 2013, different circumstances, but you would still vote against the Cameron government's wish to get authorization for action in Syria? 
It depends, of course, on the terms with which the case is presented. But, what, no, but the I, way that Cameron right, is, is well, operating right today... Now, right now, today, the answer to the question is yes. You would vote against? I would vote against. And how many of your I, fellow Tories would still, as of today, vote against? I don't know. I, colleagues will want to examine the case that the government is going to make. But you're chairman of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. Your ear is to the ground when it comes to your party and foreign affairs policy. You must have a feel whether the 30 who voted no to intervention in Syria in 2013 are still pretty much the same in number. Is that the way it feels to you? I don't have the whips office operation to hand to actually know the minds of my colleagues and exactly where they are. Uh, my instinct would be is that there is a greater willingness to engage in a target that is explicitly the defeat of ISIL. And so that in that sense you would expect the numbers resisting military intervention would be lower. Uh, however, there is uh, widespread concern about action in Syria that might engage the Russians, the Syrian regime, and uh, I hope that my colleagues will be uh, expecting the government to come forward with a military strategy that sits within a coherent international plan. And you say that must involve a very proactive role for neighbours, particularly Sunni neighbours, which would include Saudi Arabia, maybe Egypt, certainly Turkey. Mm -hmm. Working in coordination, you say, with Iran, which makes things yep. very difficult mm. from the get-go, but you also suggest that it might need boots on the ground. Now, Tony Blair believes that, mm. General Sir David Richard, yep. Lord Richards as he now is, who was the former head of the British Army, he believes that. Do you get any indication that the British government is even contemplating the possibility of putting men on the ground as part of this coherent, determined, effort to destroy Islamic State once and for all? Uh, I don't think there's any intention of having British ground forces uh, mounting operations against ISIL to take and hold ISIL territory. Uh, the key issue here is the defeat of ISIL. Uh, what is the defeat of ISIL in Iraq and Syria? It is the taking and holding of the ground currently held by them indeed and, which and it then being ground and, it, troops. and it then being administered by somebody now in iraq that is straightforward it will be the iraqi army iraqi armed forces in some form that retake iraqi territory and then administer that or the un iranians under the direction of the iraqi government or the iranians well it, it will formally be the iraqi government what the relationships are the iraqi government has with other governments is a matter obviously okay for so that's them. iraq so in syria if but you it, say but in that syria it's inconceivable four, that with british boots on the ground well in syria well in syria we have a four or five way civil war and uh different international players have uh, in effect, different clients in this game. So Iran and Russia very clearly want to see the survival of the uh, Assad regime uh, in one form or another because they see their interests as, as allied uh, with the current Syrian government. Uh, we have made strenuous efforts to try and stand up uh, the Free Syrian Army and uh, western orientated uh, forces in there, and that, that's come a complete cropper, uh, as we've seen. There's been very... Uh, there is no hard power being exercised on the ground by uh, parties to the civil war who are aligned to the West. And so the uh, other parties who are fighting this, uh, al-Nusra, which is uh, al-Qaeda linked, although the coalition within which al-Nusra sits appears to have support from Turkey and Saudi Arabia. And then, of course, on the flank of it, you then have uh, ISIL, which, of course, is the enemy of everybody. Well, that, that's a good overview of wh where things might be on the ground, but uh, let, let's be blunt. Uh, Lord Richards, former head of the British Army, says David Cameron has lacked the balls to go through with a coherent Syria policy. He goes back to 2012 when he says he presented Cameron with a plan which would have tackled Assad so much earlier on in this crisis and would have preempted and prevented the rise of the jihadist extremists in Daesh or Islamic State. He lacked the balls, Richard says, and the problem is that Cameron, even to this day, does not pursue strategy and statecraft. His approach, he says, is more about a Notting Hill we know what that signifies, liberal agenda, than it is about statecraft. Well, we're in 2015, not 1915. Uh, the decisions the United Kingdom takes and the amount of capability the United Kingdom has to apply force in the region is very considerably limited uh, by comparison to a bygone era. But can Britain still uh, not show a leadership in, in this, this is where, issue? Well, this is where uh, my advice to the government is that Britain's diplomatic weight 
which is, I think, relatively significantly greater than our hard military capability, that we should be trying to bang heads together of uh, the nations who are critical to this, Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the nations that sit behind them, the United States and Russia, to actually sit down and have uh, a, a proper discussion about the plan to defeat ISIL. And that is going to mean that people are going to have to compromise. You're over suggesting the, over that right now Putin, for example, couldn't give a hoot about what Cameron says because Cameron isn't packing a punch in the diplomatic arena. Uh, in the end, uh, uh, Putin simply doesn't give a hoot about the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom has a veto on the Security Council. So uh, if we are to try and move towards a coherent strategy towards ISIL, and we need to remember that ISIL is, a, is probably a bigger problem for the Russians than it is in this, the United Kingdom. There are uh, many Russian citizens who are now fighting for ISIL, as there indeed uh, there are some British citizens who've, uh, who've gone to fight for ISIL. There is a threat of uh, ISIL-inspired violence on the streets of Russia as there are on the streets of the United Kingdom. Uh, so all the nations surrounding us have a common interest. And the issue is whether we are going to sit down mm. and find an agreed strategy to defeat our common enemy or whether we're going to continue to be uh, engaged in, uh, in, frankly, what I would see as second-order priorities in the region. Yeah, well, uh, the, the big diplomatic picture that you're talking about doesn't seem to be happening right now. So let's. Well, just I, think it's let the, I think it's beginning to happen. Do you? Well, uh, and this, and these it may talks, take time. And let's and these, just talk about some other yeah. challenges that are much more real-time. One, the British government would say, is that there there are, there are people inside Syria today who are not just intent on fighting with Daesh, IS on the ground in Syria, but are planning attacks on the UK from bases inside Syria. Do you support David Cameron's uh, apparent uh, happiness to undertake targeted assassinations on Syrian territory? Uh, the Prime Minister's justification for that in the House of Commons was very tightly drawn that there was an immediate threat to the uh, United Kingdom. Uh, emanating, he, he told em, em, you that, but he didn't give you the evidence, did he? No, he didn't give us the evidence, which is why I th personally think it's an appropriate matter for the Intelligence and Security Committee, who should be clear to see intelligence material, to see the basis on which that decision was taken. Are you going to get the fact that evidence? That, well, I'm not on that committee, but happily that committee is chaired by the former Attorney General, uh, Dominic Grieve, so uh, they're in an ideal position to make that, to have a look at whether the uh, legal justification the Prime Minister presented uh, is justified on the basis of the intelligence he saw. But that's the case he made, and I think uh, I'm certainly not going to want to contradict him. Uh, well, I mean, on, on prima facie, do you, does it leave you feeling uneasy when what we know from officials is that the two Britons of the three who were killed were allegedly involved in a plot to undertake an attack around the uh, VE Day commemorations in London? which had actually passed off peacefully weeks before the so-called targeted assassinations by drone happened on the ground in Syria. It seems a little odd to suggest there was an imminent threat when the threat they talked about clearly hadn't happened weeks before. There is an ongoing threat from uh, British citizens who've gone to Syria, are fighting for ISIL, are in communication with uh, Britain's uh, back home and trying to egg them on here into taking action uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, these are all going to have to be matters of judgment as to uh, the uh, level of the threat presented and the justification that would then be required. Yes, but I mean, you're an independent-minded sort of bloke. You're a Tory, you're on an <coughs> important committee, but you tend to speak your mind. When you look at the evidence, for example, of the US uh, drone policy in Afghanistan and Pakistan, you see that since 2005, Literally thousands of people have been killed, and independent experts say several thousand of those people were civilians. Mm. At least 170, it is said, were children. And when you assess the efficacy of that policy in terms of degrading the extremist threat, do you believe drone strikes, now it seems part of the British government policy, work? Well, you're making a comparison between a, a strategy and one tactical intervention. But there's now apparently a kill list. It is said that the British government has other targets that it is actively contemplating to hit by drone. Uh, but the United Kingdom was, uh, in this instance, taking out uh, United Kingdom citizens who were plotting against their own, their own country. And the Prime Minister presented a clear and narrow uh, legal justification for the action that we took. Uh, we have not yet arrived where the United Kingdom is 
engaged in the kind of wider strategy of use of drones uh, against uh, targets that the United States has. And I would have the same concerns that you presented about the, the overall efficacy of that strategy as, uh, as it may be recruiting uh, more people uh, to take up arms against you, you us. You harbour those doubts, do you? Uh, I do harbour those doubts. I'll tell you somebody else. And I, would, and I would want to... Uh, and I would like to get as close as possible to the evidence to see why the United States thinks this strategy uh, is continues to be worth pursuing. Mm. I'll tell you somebody else who harbours those doubts. That is the new leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn. I have to ask you about Jeremy Corbyn because in the last couple of days uh, there's been a very active debate, not least in the media here in the United Kingdom, about whether the intelligence and military services here in the United Kingdom are prepared to cooperate with a leader of the Labour Party who, it seems, is perceived by senior figures inside the military and security establishment as a fundamental threat to the security interests of the United Kingdom. Just in terms of parliamentary and constitutional um, uh, appropriateness, mm. do you worry about these signals that are being sent? Uh, yes, I think it was a... It sounds as though there was a very inappropriate opinion reported of a serving general, as I understand. A serving it. general in the Sunday Times who said that if Corbyn were elected uh, prime minister, his words, the British military would take direct action. There would be mass resignations at all levels. You would face the very real prospect of an event which would, in effect, be a mutiny. Well, uh, he, he can speak for himself, but he's certainly speaking way outside the authority uh, of any serving officer, it would be disgraceful uh, if, if that occurred. If, if, frankly, God help us, Jeremy Corbyn is elected Prime Minister under a Labour government, uh, the army, like everybody else, will have to turn to the right and carry out the uh, instructions of the elected government. But as it's long, confusing for the British public because your party, as long as those, your party, as as long as those was, instructions are lawful. Yes, well, it's confusing for the public because your party, as soon as Corbyn was elected, issued propaganda, if I may call mm. it that, suggesting that he was a fundamental threat to the security of the United Kingdom. Well, he is. If Do you, you believe you, that or not? Uh, if you believe in a coherent defence strategy for the United Kingdom, uh, where you want two percent of uh, at least 2% of your GDP it's spent on, spent on, it? spent on defence. That's your if view. you want the United Kingdom to be properly committed to NATO, uh, then uh, I think he is a threat to our security. He would unpick uh, the whole of our uh, defence posture uh, if he was allowed to, uh, to revert to the opinions he expressed uh, before he became leader of the Labour Party. There is obviously now a very live debate within the Labour Party and within the people he's appointed uh, to his own shadow cabinet uh, about policies around all sorts of aspects of defence and security. Sure, but, but, but there is something different about saying that he is a fundamental risk to the core security of the nation. There's a very active uh, debate now about whether Cameron's government is prepared to share with Jeremy Corbyn the level of military and intelligence information, secret information that has been but shared no, in the past. Yes, but they're under no obligation to share that but, information. No, but precedent suggests they will. And actually, it's a part of accountability and transparency in a democracy that the leader of the opposition knows as much as can be safely given to him about what is no, happening no, in the name of the United Kingdom. Uh, no, it's not, I don't think. I don't think it's part of any... It may have become conventional, but I wouldn't present it in, in those terms. You don't see it as there part of, of democracy no, there are, there and transparency are, and accountability? Uh, uh, no, that the, that the leader of the opposition gets privileged access to, uh, to, to information on the basis that other members of parliament uh, don't have? No, not necessarily. It's a, that's, a, that's a judgment for the government to take. It's normally taken when the government is seeking to persuade the leader of the opposition to associate himself uh, with a particular government strategy in the seek of achieving, uh, whilst the government is seeking consensus. Uh, if the government is plainly not going to get consensus be from the leader of the opposition because he holds very strong views uh, opposed to the use of military force in almost any circumstance... And you think that's justification then, for giving him less access to information than previous leaders of oppositions in the recent past have enjoyed? Well, what would be the point of giving him the information? If, uh, if it was not an attempt to achieve consensus. All right, let, let's move on and talk about Europe briefly. There are a couple of issues at hand. One is, uh, and this is where David Cameron looks very isolated right now, the reaction to the huge migrant crisis facing the continent. Half a million migrants, mm. refugees both, uh, are believed to be coming to Europe this year. Mm. Hundreds of thousands arrived already. Now, the strain is enormous. Many countries, led by Germany, are saying that there has to be 
burden sharing, a phrase used by Angela Merkel many times, that that is the only way Europe can safeguard its values and its morality. Why has David Cameron steadfastly, adamantly refused to take any of the refugees, migrants, who are currently inside Europe? Because it's the wrong policy. I think he's entirely right not to do so. Uh, the right policy is to apply resources in the region to look after people who are genuine refugees from the conflict in Syria. And the United Kingdom, by spending 0.7% of its GDP on the development budget, means that the United Kingdom has spent something like a billion pounds supporting uh, lo the looking after of refugees in Jordan, Lebanon and Turkey. No, I, I understand that, but, 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 there, but, but there is but, an immediate but, 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 urgent but, but, humanitarian but, crisis involving Syrian but refugees part, inside well, we are, Europe. But, you abandon those but, people, but, do you? What has happened is that uh, the conventions around the handling of refugees and economic migrants has collapsed and people have not uh, affected what was existing policy properly and as a consequence they are now left with this a tidal wave of people coming who are being attracted by the fact that the European Union is not following the policies that, it, that are long established. Well, you, you've got all sorts of reasons why they're here but the fact is they are here. And is it, and, is and it and right that Britain and, and, and refuses to help yes, any it is. of them? Yes, yes it is because uh, Europe has got itself in this incredibly difficult position because it hasn't actually followed its own policies correctly. Uh, and had the European it Union, had our partners in the European Union uh, stood up to the plate as we have, uh, contributed 0.7% of their GDP to international development, the whole international community and all the international agencies would have far more resources to look after these people uh, in the, the countries uh, immediately adjacent to the conflict, which is, after all, their first place of safety. The Germans are appalled, frankly, at what the British are doing. Does that worry you, what this is doing for Britain's standing in Europe? Well, there are two things going on here. Uh, there needs to be some hard European power to help the Americans and, and like-minded countries uh, contribute to addressing the insecurity in the region. Uh, and uh, the Germans don't get anywhere near spending 2% of their GDP on defence. So they don't, aren't making, in that sense, a, uh, as indeed are nearly all our fellow European countries, not making a proper contribution to a deep... I'm a, just a, mindful a, a that decent... while you make these arguments, strategic long-term yep. arguments, there are men, women and children on the verge of starvation, homeless, without any refuge, inside Europe, and your well, there government, a, well, the Tory uh, government in the UK, refuses to help a single well, one hold, of them. Well, hold on a minute when you make those arguments. The government has committed to taking 20,000 people directly from... Not from direct, Europe, not, not these from, homeless not people Europe. inside Europe, and, and over five years. And the, there are more people arrived in Munich the, in one weekend than Britain will take over five uh, years. Uh, and if you put in place, if you continue to put in place incentives for people to do the wrong thing, which is to make this perilous journey uh, out of the refugee camps, out of the region, or out of the region directly, out of, out of Syria directly, if you're saying to people, you open the welcome signs in Germany, are you surprised there's this tidal wave of humanity trying to make this journey? And the people who are making that journey are by and large uh, fit young men who, are, uh, who, are, who think they're able to make the journey and they're people with the resources to actually pay the traffickers to actually begin that journey and get it underway. The people who don't have the resources, the people who are really vulnerable, are the ones who are being looked after by the international community in the camps. And it is those people that the United Kingdom are, are going to, are going to uh, try and help uh, with the 20,000 who would then come to the United Kingdom. Uh, and so the combination of our development policy, our defence policy, uh, and the, the immigrants we're actually going to take into the United Kingdom uh, as, part of, as part of addressing that refugee crisis, uh, means the United Kingdom is more than playing its part. And if we're then looking at we aggregated migrant flows, you need to remember the United Kingdom's population is rising 300,000 a year on the basis of net migration. The United we Kingdom is more than playing its part. We have to end there. Crispin Blunt, thanks for being on Hard Talk. Thank you very much indeed. and boys to get education. Once you actually get out there after the first couple of games, you start to settle in. Look, these things evolve. 
Nothing happens overnight. We cannot repeat the vicious cycle of the past. But I did jam with Hendrix once. That's war. We cannot have war without casualty. But, you know, the music was just written to lift. They're learning to even admire these women more. When big names talk, they talk to the BBC. Hello there. I'm going to begin this World Weather Roundup in North America, where there's rain for some, but not in the places where we need it most. Some of the heaviest downpours from New Mexico northwards into the Midwest on Thursday. Torrential thunderstorms could give two to four inches, 50 to 100 millimetres of rain in the most intense of these showers and pretty squally gusty winds as well. We've also got an area of low pressure just drifting its way inland from the Carolinas towards uh, Georgia. That could give some flooding. Thunderstorms across Florida, but in the west where we could do with some rain to dampen down the wildfires, but it looks like it's going to stay dry with temperatures about where they should be for the time of year. Now, a slightly drier story than recently on Thursday across the Yucatan Peninsula, but come further south, there are still some torrential downpours that are going to affect parts of Central America through uh, the coming days. Temperatures in San Jose, 24 degrees, just 22 in Guatemala City, where I think we are going to see a lot of rain on Thursday. Also, a lot of rain continuing to affect the river plate of South America. So through Uruguay, the far north of Argentina and the far south of Brazil, chances of some flooding, just 15 degrees in Montevideo. A weather system running its way through some northwestern parts of Africa, bringing some rain, some pretty squally gusty winds as well. But heavy downpours continue in the places we'd expect them through central areas, largely dry across South Africa. A quiet story across the Middle East on Friday. A keen northwesterly wind bringing some lifted dust and sand, I think, out of southern Iraq through Kuwait, perhaps into eastern areas of Saudi Arabia. That will reduce visibility at times. And we'll see a bit of high cloud streaming in from the west, but generally speaking, a good deal of hot sunshine with temperatures around the mid to high 30s. Now, for India, things are drying up across the northwest corner of India, also northern Pakistan, where we've seen torrential downpours so far this week. There is more heavy rain to come, though, further east through Nepal, Bhutan, some northern parts of Bangladesh. But for southern Bangladesh and Myanmar, things actually drying out quite a lot compared with what we've seen recently. Still some heavy monsoon downpours to be had further south. Some very heavy rain affecting southern areas of the Philippines on Friday. There is the risk of flooding here and across the south of Japan again the chance of flooding with some torrential downpours and then we look to the south. Another tropical storm developing in the Pacific. Uh, at the moment the track of this is somewhat uncertain but that could eventually head towards Japan bringing yet more rain through the coming days. We'll keep you up to date on that one. Now, for Australia, generally speaking, it's quieter. A bit of a cool down in Perth as the winds start to come in from the southwest, 23 degrees. A lot of fine, settled weather for central areas and actually brightening up a little bit for Adelaide and Melbourne. But it stays very windy with some rain splashing into Sydney. Some of that perhaps getting into Brisbane, where temperatures will reach 22 degrees. It's been a very wet week for New Zealand. The heaviest rain in the North Island easing off on Friday, but still the potential for some showers, some heavy rain bending into the south of the South Island. Temperatures of 11 in Christchurch and 12 in Wellington. Don't forget, you can get full forecasts for where you are or where you're going online. Do you think about your mum and dad? Yeah, I love you. I feel ashamed. I don't have words to say how I feel. Our World is a unique series of films on the BBC, offering personal insights into global events. Oh, see that. Our World, stories that speak for themselves.